All right, so we are starting um, the next set of talks here. Our first um, presenter is Sarah Bennett from Mercy Christ University, um, a lecturer of biology and a sustainability coordinator. And she's going to be talking about producing cigarette litter at Beach 10 on Prescott Isle State Park. Okay, thank you. So I want to tell you a little bit about our project today that I've been working on just since this summer. Uh, working on reducing litter, cigarette litter at Beach 10, Bugney Beach out here at Presque Isle State Park, but also um, collecting data to show that those efforts have been successful. So Mercyhurst adopted Beach 10 in 2013 when the Adopt-A-Beach program came to the area, and we've been cleaning that beach up from roughly April or May until October every year since then. There have been a few months in there where we haven't had a volunteer team to go out, but for the most part, it's been uh, April or May through October. We started out, uh, the program started with cleanups in April, and the, the April cleanup has been dropped, I think mostly because of weather. So more recently, we've been starting in May each year. So if you've ever participated in a beach cleanup uh, through the adopt -a beach program or through the International Coastal Cleanup, you will, will know that you don't just clean up the trash, you also keep track of what it is that you clean up. My, my <coughs> student volunteers are always surprised to see that, that they uh, have to count what they're picking up as well. But it, we, we do it in teams, and so somebody's tallying while, while another person is picking up. So what that does is it creates this really great opportunity to have an abundant amount of data, <coughs> historical data included, to allow us to look at efforts and uh, maybe as assess whether or not our efforts have been successful. But as I was participating in these beach cleanups, I didn't start organizing the cleanup for Mercyhurst until this summer. As I was participating, I thought, I'm kind of picking up the same things over and over, and there aren't really a lot of efforts to prevent some of that material from getting onto the beach in the first place. So that really is what started this idea for this project. To look at some data over the years, so this is showing data from 2013, 2014, and 2015, I'm sorry, and 16. You see the same thing pop up as the number one item picked up every single year, and that is cigarette butts. We also have small plastic pieces and food wrappers on there. Um, caps and lids and straws and stirrers for some reason are up there in 2014, but those seem to have diminished in popularity, or I don't know, they're being cleaned up more, I'm not sure. Uh, but cigarette butts are always number one. And that is the case at Presque Isle State Park at all of the beach cleanups. That's the case during international coastal cleanup. But it's also the case any, with any litter cleanup that you do in the area. And it turns out the area is not alone in that, in, in that phenomenon. So in fact, cigarette butts are the most common beach litter, litter cleaned up worldwide. It's also, just in general, the most common litter cleaned up worldwide, not just on beaches. So this is obviously, obviously a problem. <clears throat> so as far as, you know, it's not just an unsightly problem. It can cause a couple of more serious problems as well. So we all know, if you're from the Erie area, you know that Presque Isle is a really big tourist attraction. And to go out on the beach and see cigarette butts littering the parking lots and the beach, is one thing, you know, it's unsightly and it kind of creates a negative feel for your experience. In addition to that, we have a lot of children who play on those beaches. And those children may, especially the younger ones, may pick up those cigarette butts, which is gross on its own, but they can possibly in ingest it as well. And that ingestion, just with one cigarette butt, can cause a temporary nicotine um, toxicity. And what that looks like is increased alertness, uh, but also vomiting, and just generally feeling sick for oops, several hours. They don't tend to have long-term effects to that, which is good, but it still would be a really negative experience as well. I don't think this happens that often at Press Pile, but it's a potential. More importantly, we can see the effects of cigarette litter in the water. And so there have been several studies over the years that have looked at what can come from cigarette butts? What is coming from cigarette butts? And do we actually see that in the environment? So this first study here, I can use my pointer here. This first
first study was done in Germany, and they looked at cigarette butts uh, leachate getting into puddles and runoff. And they found that one cigarette butt could contaminate 1,000 liters of water and can do it relatively quickly. So this figure on the right shows the time at which nicotine is released into the water. So one cigarette butt can contaminate 1,000 liters of water in, in, and this was in an urban situation, and their point was that, if, that you're contaminating drinking water with nicotine. Another study found, uh, studied what actually leaches out of a smoked cigarette butt. A lot of these studies make it set a difference between smoked and unsmoked, whether or not it's just the filter or you have that little bit of tobacco left on the cigarette butt as well. And it turns out, and I don't think this is very surprising, but it turns out that the smoked cigarette butt with the little bit of tobacco, which is what we find most of the time on the beach, is the most harmful. Because when a cigarette butt is, when a cigarette is burned, there's chemical reactions that causes all of those additives <coughs> to produce many more chemicals than were added to that initial cigarette. So the second study looked at the leachate that was coming from cigarette butts, and they found that heavy metals uh, could come from cigarette butt, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, some of which are carcinogenic, lead, and arsenic all leached out of that cigarette butt into the water. Now this was done in the lab. Uh, most of these studies are done in the lab so they can control the conditions, and we have a need for looking need for these studies in the environment. This third study up here is showing that nicotine in Spain was detected in bottled water coming from aquifers. So that tells us that the nicotine is getting into the environment and is getting into the groundwater. And then finally, we have uh, two studies here that show um, the, the first one was done in Sweden and the other one was done in the Great Lakes finding nicotine and its metabolites detected in surface waters. Now we don't know if that nic these nicotine sources are coming from cigarette butt leachate. It could be coming from wastewater treatment plants as well because nicotine is not pulled out of the water. But we've established that the leachates are harmful, that there are harmful leachates coming from these cigarette butts and that at least nicotine is in the environment. These other ones have been found in the environment, but they have other sources as well. So we don't know to what degree they would be. They could be attributable, attributed to cigarette butts. And then finally, the uh, third potential problem with cigarette butts is their effects on wildlife. So the nicotine found in water is at very small concentrations, probably too small to have effects on humans if you're just drinking it in your drinking water. But that chronic exposure in the environment, especially to small aquatic organisms, could have some potentially negative effects. So first of all, one, one method that, one way that wildlife could be affected by these is through just consuming the cigarette butts if they get into the water, or on the beach if it's a bird maybe. But that research has, has not shown that that happens very often. I think birds, uh, not birds, but organisms in general are pretty good at steering away from those chemicals. They probably detect them and then are able to stay away from them. But cigarette filters are made from cellulose acetate. And that's a plastic, a bioplastic, that breaks down in the water due to the water itself and also sunlight. So those microfibers are, this, these filters break down into microfibers and those microfibers are another source, a uh, potential source of harm to wildlife. There was one study, this, this uh, study by Wright and colleagues was done. Uh, they tried to evaluate the effects of these microfibers on those organisms, but were not able to, uh, did, they didn't find a direct negative effect of those microfibers on the organisms that they were studying. Uh, they specifically were looking at the ragworm that is right here. That's just one study though, so I mean, we don't know the effect in the environment. And then, Probably the biggest source of potential harm to wildlife comes from the leachate from the cigarette butts, especially from the smoked butts. Uh, several studies have found lethal effects on medaca fish, on top smelt, fathead minnows. Uh, we found 
uh, lethal effects on daphnia and vibrio fissuri. So we see effects on bacteria, vertebrates, and invertebrates. Again, these were all done in the lab. We have not, th these have not been evaluated in the, in the environment. And then sublethal effects have, both been, have also been found in Madaka fish and ragworms, specifically in their development or behavior. So cigarette leachate does, at least in the lab, have effects on, on the organisms that we're testing. Uh, and this, these effects are dose dependent. Smaller doses have lesser effects. Greater doses have, or tend to be the more lethal effects. But greater really isn't that much. We're talking about one cigarette butt per liter in a lot of instances. So that brings me to the project that we've been working on out here at Presque Isle. Um, like I said, I had been participating in these beach cleanups for a while, and we, you know, it's great to clean up and it feels good to be doing that, but it feels, would feel even better to prevent some of that litter from getting out there. And so I started this project earlier this year. I applied for a grant through Keep America Beautiful. They have a cigarette litter prevention program, and also through a regional science consortium. And we were able to purchase and install six cigarette receptacles out at Beach 10. I'll show you where they're installed in just a little bit. Uh, at each installation, they were installed on a six by six post. They're uh, screwed in nice and tight, so they should last the winter out there. We'll be checking them to make sure. Uh, and then each receptacle has this sign with it indicating that cigarette butts are litter too. So let's keep them off of the beach. Here is Beach 10, and the top of the picture here is, is due north. So we have six installations of these receptacles. We have one over here on the West Beach. These are what I named them, these locations. We have, this is the main parking lot for Beach 10. So we have three receptacles in that area, the West Main Beach, East Main Beach, and West Concessions. This is the concession stand right here. And then we have a receptacle on the other side of the concession stand, and then one over here, there's another entrance to the beach right there. So we call that East Beach. There is a, another entrance a little further east, but it's not as widely used. We didn't put a receptacle there. So since we installed those receptacles in early August, uh, we have been checking them every one to two weeks. I have a student who's been going out to check those, and he collects the cigarette butts and counts them. Not the most, not the greatest job in the world, but he's done a great job with it. Um, so we collect those cigarette butts and we put them all in a bag and we deliver them to Brian Gula here with the DCNR and he sends them to a company called TerraCycle that cleans and recycles those cigarette butts. So not only are we keeping them off the beach, they also have another life afterwards. Uh, we have successfully kept 956 cigarette butts off of the beach through these receptacles. We did find out in late September that that's probably a, 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 low, a low number because it turns out maintenance was also emptying these receptacles, uh, even though they, there was a miscommunication. So uh, next year we'll communicate that and maybe we'll get some more accurate numbers there. Uh, we, if we take a look at the numbers per receptacle, we can see that uh, those receptacles around the main entrance to the beach get more cigarette butts, which is expected. I wanted to get a little bit of, this project is not done, these certainly are uh, preliminary results, but I wanted to get an idea of where we were compared to past years. And so I compared data from this, this year, 2017, um, compared data to the past years, but I only included May, August, and September because those are the only months that we have data from all, all three of those months from every So I didn't want to include months, uh, for example, 2013, we, we cleaned up in April, but we didn't clean up in April and May. So a straight number wouldn't have worked here. Uh, so preliminarily it looks like 2017 has reduced number of cigarette butts compared to previous years. And I am happy to report that just since August, uh, just, you know, we've only had these receptacles installed since August, I'm happy to report that for the first time since we started cleaning up Beach 10, cigarette butts are no longer the number one item picked up. So 
so they have been reduced. Um, I, I was a little, I was skeptical about this to really say, oh, this is due to our efforts because it felt like this summer was kind of a mild summer. Uh, so I took a look at some, oh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Took a look at some temperature data here just to see if we actually were as mild as it felt. And it turns out, no, we weren't. We were really kind of middle of the pack. So 2017 is this, it's hard to see these colors, but this dark blue line. We did have a really cold May, but in the summer, the temperatures were really right with everything else. And it also looks like it felt mild because last year, this top number 2016 was so warm. So it, that's good for us because it's showing that you know, the effects probably are due to our receptacles being there. Additionally, I wanted to look at data uh, by month and just looking at the months since we had it installed, so August, September, and October. And we do see reduced numbers in all three of those months since the receptacles were, were installed. Okay, so it looks like we're being successful. Uh, we've only had three months of data to look at this, and so I'm looking forward to next year. We're going to have a second field season where we are going out and checking those receptacles, counting the cigarette butts. We'll also be continuing the Adopt a Beach cleanups and I'm using those data and past adopt a beach data to show the impacts of the receptacles mm -hmm. that we've installed. Additionally, I was part of this project is a public awareness campaign and because we had installed those cigarette receptacles so late in the summer, I wasn't able to do a whole lot with that public awareness this year. So I'm planning on doing more with that next year. One of the things we did do this year is participate in Discover Presque Isle. Um, one thing we do with these public awareness campaigns is we go out and with a pamphlet, we hand out these pocket ashtrays that you see here. Uh, and I was kind of hesitant to do, you know, I was so nervous about how that was gonna go, but people have been so receptive to it and they're so happy to get something uh, that allows them to, it prevents them from tossing their cigarette butts on the floor, on the ground because they don't want to toss them into the trash because that's going to cause a fire. So they, people really kind of feel like they don't have anywhere to put their cigarette butts. So what these are, are they're just tiny little plastic containers. You flip them open, they're full of metal, and so the cigarette butt gets put out there. You can close it and hold on to it until you get to a place where you can dispose of those cigarette butts responsibly. Uh, so we're going to be ramping up that public awareness campaign next year, including setting up a tent out on the beach and handing out these, these pocket ashtrays, as well as walking the beach and handing them out. Uh, in future, next year, I think we'll keep the receptacles where they are, just so that we, have, uh, we don't change anything for next year. Uh, but after that, we may take a look at moving receptacles or increasing the receptac number of receptacles out there. Uh, we find a lot of cigarette litter in the parking lot, and right now we don't have any receptacles in the parking lot, uh, so it might be useful to put a, a receptacle out there. Additionally, they, we could purchase some under-the-table receptacles that could go on the picnic tables, and that's where, a lot, where we get a lot of our cigarette litter is in that region, because that's where people are congregating. So we can take a look at at um, installing some of those table cigarette litter um, canisters as well. So that's kind of where we are with this project. Looks like it's successful, that's really great news. I'm hoping that next year we continue to see that trend and that these data can be used to hopefully introduce receptacles in all of the beaches where smoking is allowed at Presque Isle. So in conclusion, I would like to thank several people uh, my student, Mark Mullinger, who has been diligently getting out here and checking those cigarette receptacles. Uh, he started this summer. He, this summer, he also was joined with Amira Fight, Amira Rose, but she has not been working this fall. I'd also like to thank Brian Gula. He did a similar project introducing the receptacles at a few other beaches at Presque Isle, so he's been a great resource for me. He also did most of the installation of those six by six posts, which was very hot work on that hot August 2nd day. So thank you very much to John, or to Brian. John Laskos organizes the Adopt-A-Beach program. 
And thank you to Holly Best for also helping us with organizing um, the Discover Press style and our efforts out here. Uh, I'd like to thank Keep Erie County Beautiful, especially Brittany Prishak. They've been a good partner and will continue to be a great partner with our campaign next year. Um, and then Mill Creek and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection are also part of our task force to help with that public awareness campaign. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. I should thank my, my funding as well. Uh, <laughs> Keep America Beautiful, the Cigarette Litter Prevention Program, and Regional Science Consortium. We would not have been able to do this without It makes me wonder if you put receptacles up for, say, straws, plastic lids, if people will actually use them. It seems kind of silly. Here you have a garbage can, they can't put them in there. They could, well, like you say, they're concerned about a fire with cigarette butts. Mm -hmm. just an experiment. It'd be interesting to see if they'd use that. My, but actually, my question is these receptacles for the cigarette butts, mm -hmm. is it just small enough for a cigarette butt? So people can't throw other things in there. They do throw other things okay. in there. <laughs> Um, they are small, um, there are small holes in them, but people stuff trash in there. Okay. So that's been kind of a gross thing to deal with. But um, I think part of that, and there are reasons for this, is that, you know, at the West Beach, for example, there's no trash can there. And uh, that's probably due to maintenance, you know, resources and things like that. But I think having more trash cans would probably prevent trash on the beaches. But how do you implement that and are there the resources for that would be another issue. But yes, people definitely are putting some trash in there. <laughs> I, I just want to say I agree about the trash cans. I was I did it off the beach for quite a while and there's definitely not enough trash cans. Mm -hmm. But the other uh, thing I wanted to teach you mention is um, especially like the cigarette butts in the parking lot, there's a lot of confusion, especially when you have people from like Pittsburgh and stuff like that coming up. That they're not sure if the beaches are, are uh, if it's you know, if you can smoke on it or not. So it's like they just come to the beach and they just kind of assume, well, oh, I can't smoke here, and they're just automatically mm -hmm. putting their cigarette yeah. out there. So maybe I like think we also get back. some people who are going for a drive and they like to take that drive out at Presque Isle and they'll oh, empty yeah. their cigarette butts right into the yeah. parking lot. Um, that I don't. I mean, that really could just go in the dumpster, but right. That's other behavior that we have. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Daniel Kaufman, who's talking about teens and environmental awareness from the Student Conservation Association in Pennsylvania Outdoor Courts. Good afternoon. Um, today I'd like to talk to you a little bit, like I said, about teens and environmental <laughs> awareness. Um, over the last summer, I had the opportunity to work with the Student Conservation Association um, with 10 high school students and another co-leader and we would travel to various locations from state park to state park um, in helping with much needed maintenance, uh, trail maintenance, repair work on structures, things of that nature. Um, and if anyone is aware of the new nature-based play area on uh, Beach 11, we actually did a lot of work um, out there. Very rewarding. Uh, the whole thing, though, happened to bring to mind something that uh, I remember seeing, and I'm going to date myself here, uh, watching Johnny Carson a long time ago. He had uh, Carl Sagan on as a guest, and Carl Sagan made a very profound statement that, says, that said um, that children are one of our most underutilized resources, that they are natural born scientists and that we just seem to beat it out of them at a young age and you know very few seem to trickle through the system with that love for science and appreciation for it to carry on in their adult lives um, so you know we, we see that more and more every day now with the effects of climate change deniers it seems like the political powers that want to uh, have a war on science uh, we, we really need to start tapping into this resource a little bit better um, so here's a little bit of information about the SCA. Uh, like I said, they uh, have been working for 60 years to bring young minds into a more environmentally aware situation, taking care of their environment. Uh, the SCA specifically wants to target uh, young urban youths, ages 14 to 18. Uh, the reason being 
is because when we think of our urban youths, we think of this as their backyard. I mean, that's, that's very accurate. You know, they look at nothing but a sea of concrete. They're surrounded by concrete everywhere they look. Um, a lot of these cities will have beautiful parks. They will take a lot of time, a lot of energy into making parks um, for the kids. But, you know, like this one here, this is in Chicago. This is a beautiful park, but at the same time, we still see it uh, separated, isolated from nature. You know, kids should be out here, they're in here, once again, on that concrete. And that's something that we would really like to try to get them, uh, get away from them. So, with the goal of reaching more youths and a little bit of help with the par uh, Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps um, and the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, the SCA last year, or this year, I'm sorry, uh, 2017, expanded their program from five cities to 14. Uh, that's a 39% increase in teens that were now getting outdoors, working outdoors, and realizing that there's more to just being outdoors than working as a landscaper. Uh, so that, that's an impressive job with more plans. Sorry about that. Uh, in 2018. So, like I said, this is this is a big jump. We saw a lot of a lot of kids all over the state. Um, I'm sorry. So we took these kids, and we wanted to see. I wanted to know if this program was effectively meeting their goals. Um, member responses to surveys after the program, they start to answer that question. They were asked about conservation, leadership careers. Uh, now, I'm not going to bore anyone. The, the Likert scale went on about a lot of simple things, too, like how much soda pop uh, these kids drink. I'm not going to bore you with that kind of information. Um, these data were gathered from Houston, uh, Chicago, New York, Baltimore, Seattle, and the Fran uh, San Francisco Bay Area, as well as the 14 new groups here in Pennsylvania. Out of 646 total members, we had 448 um, responses that participated in the post-survey assessments. This gives us a response rate of about 69%. So we have here, this is the PA response rate. So when asked these questions on the Likert scale, this was a response of four or five. Um, so we were, we were seeing that they were learning about conservation resources and protect the planet. They were more responsible. They were also learning about the jobs needed to carry them on into the future. Um, there's a lot more of information um, that came with that data, so if anybody's interested in that, you can just let me know. Um, however, another goal of the program is exposing urban youth to nature. Uh, looking at the data a little further, I noticed a little bit of an anomaly um, here, especially here in Pennsylvania, that we shifted away from a diversity where the non-PA SCA through, like I said, Houston, Chicago, New York City, uh, we had a nice diversity level here. Well, when we get into Pennsylvania, that's 14 different cities, we went, we went white, heavy white too. Uh, a lot of them were also rurals. And this, this is away from what we were trying to do. This is away from the, the target demographic. Um, so why the shift in that target demographic? The, the thought was that we were going from five to 14 cities uh, demanded a new way of advertisement. The old way was simple word of mouth uh, in various organizations uh, that would participate in things like this. Not a very effective way. Uh, a small inkling into uh, social media. So it, it, was, it was, like I said, it was on a small scale. So that's, that's, they decided to pick it up. They said, what can we do? The chosen platform was Facebook. And let's start doing our advertisement with Facebook. Um, get it out there in mass. And when I, we started asking some of the kids how they heard of the program, um, their answer was pretty much uh, from my parents. And the second response was, I didn't even hear the program. My parents just told me I had a job. <laughs> Which this, this is kind of disturbing, because when you think about it now, the parents are also filling out the applications. The kids are not taking that necessary step to answer the questions to show whether or not they're actually interested in this. Um, so, you know, we wanted to take a look at that too. And what we found here was social media, 
usage, especially in teens, changes very, very rapidly. It, it's, it's a very unreliable resource when you think about it. What was good one year is not necessarily going to be the next. Um, some of this research shows that uh, in 2015, 71% of teens aged 13 through 75 were using Facebook, making it the most highly utilized uh, social media platform. However, data from 2017 indicate that Snapchat and Instagram, they were on, on the rise. I have a 13-year-old uh, teenager. When I asked him, he, I didn't even get to finish the question. He said Instagram, uh, or Snap, uh, it was Instagram. Um, that was his favorite, favorite thing. I asked him about Facebook. He has a page. He doesn't even look at it. So you can see that the shift there is, is dramatic. And so it makes it a very unreliable source. So, you know, but it's still getting to the parents. Um, it also is kind of unreliable when you think about it. If these kids are looking at it, why aren't they getting the information necessary? Well, an inhibiting factor that probably plays a huge problem here is algorithms and targeting advertisement. You know, if a parent is looking for jobs for the kids, they're going to get hits all the time through that targeting advertisement. You know, SCA is going to jump onto that board. They're going to see that stuff. Kids. They're looking at shoes, they're looking at clothes, they're looking at video games. They're not looking at the things that are gonna let those algorithms target them for looking for a job position and give them the information such as what we're trying to get out to them. Um, so, you know, what can we do to change that? How can we get this information? Well, it's my belief that I think we need to step back um, away from the reliance on technology, which makes sense, because we're trying to get back into nature, uh, and get kids to get out there to where the kids are, in the classrooms, uh, where they're hanging out, you know, in these urban projects, one-on-one -on -one, uh, talks, you know, like I said, to, to really, to make the effect, it has to be a little bit of a, more of a low-tech communications. Um, it, it, this needs to be done a little bit more aggressively than in the past. Uh, when, when they were originally doing the, the um, word of mouth, it was very, very non-aggressive. It, it was just very passive. So now we need to be a little bit more aggressive on how to get that work out there. Uh, one idea that I had is Go College, um, as using as an example. Uh, Go College, it could be used at, you know, Systems like this could be used to better attract target demographics. Um, this is a federally funded local program in the Erie schools that uh, provide information and resources to high school kids, um, kids that are first generation college kids, um, that have some more racial diversity. Now that doesn't mean that any kid can't make use of something like this, but there are standards that have to be met requirements first before anyone else can just jump in. So this is a good, good thing here. So when, when it's done right, we can see a circular effect here. You know, if we incorporate it, educate, employ, and grow, these kids can move on into the future uh, to take those lessons to their kids. Um, and as with anything, there's always room to grow. The, these bumps in the road, they're, they're to be expected um, when doing such a large expansion. Uh, but that road, I mean, it does seem to lead to success. Any questions? I'd also say I'd like to give special thanks to some of the people that helped me. Peter Gernsheimer, uh, he is a project manager for the SCA. Uh, Dr. Greg Andreso, he is uh, my advisor at Gaming University. And Dr. Lori Lindley, who helped me you know, kind of formulate and allowed me to run some of these ideas off her. She got to listen to this many, many times. <laughs> All right, any questions? So what sort of activity do the activities do the kids do um, with this program? Yeah. yeah well, what, it's a, a six-week program, and each week has, also has to have an environmental education day. So, I mean, this is, the, this is a paid program, so these kids are earning money. Uh, we take them to a job site, like I said, um, Beach 11 is a good example with a nature-based uh, play area. Um, you know, we put up the uh, split rail fence. We laid the foundation for the trail. We also went to uh, like Hunter Run Track, 
the Erie Bluffs, did a lot of trail maintenance out there, putting up signage, so, you know, to make it easier for people to, you know, go hiking and know where they're at uh, compared to the map that they just got. Um, and then, like I said, the, the, the important aspect, too, was that weekly environmental education day. Uh, we would take various activities. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Ann Grace was kind enough to supply us with the Environaut, gain its boat, uh, took us out in the lake, we did a little trawling, a little um, fish sampling. So, and, and then of course, then he brought them back here to the, to the Tom Bridge Environmental Center, and we got to you know, do a little bit of dissection and counting, and they got to see how the whole system of, of counting all these fish work, and you know, when you have thousands of these little fish, you know, it, was, it was quite involved. Anything else? Anything else? All right, thank you
and of course drinking water. We assume in archaeological populations it's not bottled avian. We assume that it's probably locally sourced. Um, and the body water composition, it does reflect mainly that imbibed water. And to a much, much lesser extent, we do have contributions from both air and food. But we're really linking it mainly to the imbibed water. And the oxygen in the water that we drink is linked to a number of different factors, including altitude, latitude, seasonal temperature variations, aridity, and precipitation fluctuations. These are all environmental patterns. Unfortunately, the isoscapes that we'll talk about in a few minutes that we compare our modern or our archaeological samples to are derived from modern values because we, even with ice cores and stuff, we can't go in the way back and determine these isoscapes one for one. So there is a little bit of variability with our interpretations, just to acknowledge that that's a point of error there. Um, but in general, what we see through the Rayleigh distillation process is a variable loss of 16O through evaporation, because it is lighter, it's easier to evaporate. And we see a progressive loss of 18O as the air mass moves inland from its source, presumably, the ocean, right, and upwards in altitude and in elevation. So, oh, and just to touch back there, um, we have the Rayleigh distillation there, and just shows you how it goes up there. And this here is an isoscape that I previously mentioned. This really does reflect those Rayleigh distillations, the patterns that we see with water being repeated. Uh, this is the one for the United States. We also have ones on global scales as well that we compare to. So human appetite that we're looking at is really contained in tooth enamel, uh, which is reflected of the first 10 years of life, and bone, which is the last 10 to 20 years of life, depending on the kind of bone you choose. So ribs are considered to be the last 10 years of life, and the long bones are our last 20 years of life. With uh, carbon, what we see is differences in carbon incorporation, that fractionation of carbon in the plant tissues is based a lot on carbon fixation depending on the methods that the plants use to incorporate that carbon into the tissue. So we have C3 plants that are Calvin cycle, we have the hatch slack, uh, hatch slack cycle, which is C4, and the Crassulacean absolute metabolism, which is CAM. For the purposes of this study, we do know historically um, as well as biomass related, there is not a significant quantity of camp plants within the Wyoming Territory or within the United States in general. People are not deriving the main components of their nutrition off of CAM. So we kind of just say they may have been in there, but they don't play a major role. And you'll see why that's important in just a second. With our values here, how we differentiate between C3 and C4 and CAM plants in the diet is we look at basically compared to a standard sample, we look at these values. So negative 35 per mil to negative 22 per mil represents C3. C3 plants are pretty much anything you eat in your diet. So rice, wheat, oats, barley, anything you can think of, most likely is going to default to a C3. Uh, C4s, uh, negative 15 to negative 10, so you can see there is a, a pretty marked difference there. These C4s are corn and sugar cane big components in more modern diets, right? Uh, we also see amaranth, sorghum, millet, and some types of grasses native to Wyoming. Those grasses, such as Indian rice grass, grass play a very minor component in diet. They're not a major source of nutrition, though. And the can plants, as you can see, where it gets tricky is they overlap the two. Because they, once again, they're not a major biomass contributor. We do kind of exclude them from consideration when we're talking about this and we don't have pineapple in Wyoming, just for clarification. It's just kind of a fun fact that it is a CAM plant. So the nitrogen cycle, we look at nitrogen fixation in the environment, and nitrogen's incredibly important because it actually plays a role in the protein component of the organic fraction of bone and tooth, so the collagen. And so to understand the role of protein in the diet of an individual, we have to understand the nitrogen isotope composition of that organic fraction of the collagen. We do know that with nitrogen, you have a stepwise increase in the nitrogen values of tissues with trophic level increases. So we see this stepwise enrichment, or stepwise, like, 
increase. We call it an enrichment. Um, and we expect an enrichment of approximately three per mil per trophic level on these nitrogen values. So we can talk about lower order and then higher order consumers. So the animals that are solely consumers of plants, so your lower order consumers, have a much lower nitrogen value than a higher order consumer, such as a carnivore. And with the processing here, uh, these processes are developed off of traditional methods developed by Ambrose, Turner, Schrodinger, a variety of different individuals and research organizations that have come up with methods to separate carbonate, so the inorganic fraction of bone, from collagen, which is the or organic fraction of bone. Our carbonate gives us an idea of oxygen, uh, so that relates to our diet and mobility, or our, di our mobility, and the carbon, which relates to our diet. And the carbon portion of the carbonate that we're looking at really relates to diet energy sources. And we'll get into that a little bit later too. And the collagen itself, collagen is organic. We analyze that for carbon-based diet protein. So a little different, it's both carbon, just a little different fraction we're looking at. And nitrogen, of course, to look at the protein and trophic level consumption. And our precision is listed here for the University of Wyoming Stable Isotope Facility where all the samples were processed. So Fort Bridger. Fort Bridger, let's see if you can find your work. Bridger is right there in the red. And to give you an idea, this is the state of Wyoming. The university is located here, and that's our capital there. So kind of in the southern part, and right over the border here is where Utah is. And then south, we have Colorado. So kind of in the corner there. Uh, Fort Bridger, um, that is Jim Bridger, who's actually one of the more well-known early explorers of Wyoming. Jim Bridger came to Wyoming in 1822 as a fur trader. He stuck around and realized that fur was not the way to go to make money, but you could make money selling things to migrants along the immigrant trail. So he opened up a trading post in 1842. And this trading post became a place where individuals would come trade furs with Native Americans. He had a great relationship with the local Native American groups. And then sometime in the mid 1850s, um, Mormon individuals began to move because of its location right near, near Utah. We had a massive group of Mormon individuals move through and they decided to seize the fort from Bridger. This led to conflicts with the U.S. military and in 1857, in response to the military action against the Mormons, the Mormons burnt the, fort Bridger, trading, or the Bridger trading post down. In 1857, the U.S. Army said, well, this is a pretty good strategic location for us we're gonna build Fort Bridger here. So that's how it gets its name. And in 1859, troops began to be stationed from the US military there to protect the interest of the non-indigenous parties, the non-Native American, predominantly Euro-American travelers along the trails from the actual Native Americans in the region who were considered to be a bit hostile. And unfortunately though, the reason that they were stationed there wasn't exactly positive, but the good news is they really didn't see any conflict at Fort Bridger. So these guys just kind of hung out, kept the peace, nothing really happened in there, and in 1878, the post was closed because they had not seen any action. Now, what is so unusual about the fact that we have a headstone here? Well, it's unusual that we have a headstone. It's unusual that the headstone is actually relatively in association with a burial. We very rarely in the archaeological record get a name associated with an individual. More than that, it's really rare to have the date of death as well as the place of birth. So the question becomes, is the individual associated with this headstone really John Sharp? Is he really from Richmond, Virginia? The reason we ask this question is there were two individuals buried mere feet, basically side by side, mere feet apart. So who actually is John Sharp? We're going to assume it's the one that the headstone's directly over, but we need to get some further proof of this. So to test this, what we did is we looked at enamel samples to 
represent the first 10 years of life. We looked at the enamel carbonate, the inorganic fraction, compared it against those oxygen isoscapes for the Richmond, Virginia area to see whether or not he may have actually been from there. We also looked at his mobility across his lifespan. Was he born in Richmond, Virginia? Did he stay in Richmond, Virginia and then come to Wyoming immediately before death or was there some mobility in between? And we were curious about his diet because we don't have a lot of information. In fact, this is the first study that's ever been done for the Wyoming Territory or the Intermountain West in general related to human analysis uh, or human remains with stable isotope analysis. So this is all for building the database essentially. And so what we found with his canine, you see there, Canine represents the first 10 years of life. Rig represents the last 10 years of life. So the canine, what the canine shows us is if we look here, it falls right around there, which it's difficult to see with the coloration on here, but it does align well with the Richmond, Virginia region. And with his rib, we see it falls approximately here. Now, the region we were talking about previously with Fort Bridger is here. So, where does this complication come about? Well, the bone values are, on average, a weighted sum of the water consumed within the last 10 years of life. As such, this weighted average here represents drastic mobility, but not necessarily spending a decade in this region here. So we do see some drastic mobility. So, is there a difference between the enamel oxygen value and that for the Virginia ice escape? No this does give us further suggestion that this individual may in fact be John Sharp. Do we see a significant change between the beginning of life and the end of life oxygen isoscape values indicating residential mobility? Yes, which would make sense if he's from Virginia and is buried in Wyoming. And as far as his diet, we have the canine here showing a carbon value of negative 18.7, so this is for our diet energy components. So primarily our carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins that are not used in protein synthesis in the body. And our rib is negative 20.9. So we can see these are our values that we mentioned earlier, C3, C4. We see a diet composed of mixed C3 and C4 resource bases, as would be expected for this time period. Do we see a significant change between the enamel and the uh, bone carbonate values, indicating a really significant change in diet over the lifespan? No. We don't. This may be due to increased levels of trade, or it could be a masking effect where the individual is consuming, we'll say, rice on the East Coast, but more wheat when he gets out West. Those values would be pretty well commensurate, so you wouldn't see any difference between the two. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to obtain bone and tooth collagen at this time, so we weren't able to look at the protein fraction, but that's something for the future. And so in general, for this individual, HR058, which is our lab code, is he possibly from Richmond, Virginia? Yes, it's a, it's a distinct possibility based on his oxygen isotopes from the enamel. Do we see significant changes in diet over the lifespan? No. Do we see significant residential mobility over the lifespan? Yes. And next up, we would like to do strontium analysis to test and make sure that he indeed is from Richmond, Virginia. And the last place we have to look at is Fort Bridger, and here we go, it's up near, um, Fort, no, yeah, Flat Bridge Station, my apologies, Flat Bridge Station, Fort Casper. Um, it's right up here, we have Cheyenne there, and the University of Wyoming is right there, so in the center of the state. And Flat Bridge Station is an interesting place because Flat Bridge Station was located pretty close to the North, North Platte River, including an area, um, in 1859 that was constructed as a place where people could cross, pay a toll bridge, basically. Um, this became known as Fort Casper in 1865, but before this, unlike Fort Bridger, there were massive Native American raids on immigrants passing through this area. So they really did need that army force to be put into place there. So by November 1865, we had as many as 343 soldiers assigned to this tiny little post, the Platte Bridge Station at the time. And um, the action kind of died down after a while, so by 1867 it was abandoned. And we have an unusual case here. HR 166 is not associated with a headstone, but he does have significant trauma that was documented for an individual named George Camp. 
the trauma we see on HR 166 is commensurate with what we see for George Camp, which he sustained during the Battle of uh, Platte Bridge Station on July 26, 1865, which aligns well with the artifacts we found with him. He would have been interred around that time. So is HR 166 George Camp? Big question, went through some military records, found out that he was born, if it is indeed George Camp, in Montgomery County, Illinois. So same ideas, we're testing the enamel, we're testing mobility, and we're testing diet. And what we see here is, it's right around here, so once again, it aligns pretty well. We unfortunately did not have bone uh, sample for him to look at the mobility across the lifespan, but one can assume if he was born, clicking back here, if he was born up here, and he was buried over here, that there might be some mobility. Um, so do we see a difference between the enamel oxygen isotope for Montgomery County and for this individual? No, does this suggest that it possibly could be George Camp? Yes. We don't have any carbonate for bone at this point. And for the second premolar for the first decade of life, we see a diet that's pretty heavy into the C3, but we could have some contribution from C4 resources as well. We do have collagen with this individual from the femur, representing the last two decades of life, which shows us that we, once again, are pretty close to that C3, C4 mix. With the nitrogen off of this, we do see a diet that is heavily sourced in terrestrial proteins, with possible inclusion from some marine sources, if not all terrestrial with higher order terrestrial consumer. Uh, consumption. So enamel and bone, we unfortunately don't have any to compare here for the carbonate, so we're not able to do a comparison of those at this time, but we do see mixed diet C3, C4 with some trophic consumption of higher order terrestrials. Is it possible this individual is from Montgomery County, Illinois? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, significant residential mobility, undetermined at this time. Significant changes in diet, undetermined. Next up, we'd like to do strontium for him as well as get those carbonate samples for bones to do advanced comparison. Um, and in conclusion, does this support our identities that we propose? Yes, it does suggest and support. We do need to do further analyses to confirm this, and we'd like to redo the analyses for the collagen to ensure what we're seeing is accurate across the board. And many thanks to my dissertation committee, I just defended on October 11th, yay, um, for putting up with me for five years. And the funding from the George Prison Institute, Wyoming Archaeological Society, and the Loveland Archaeological Society, and Mercyhurst University is continuing to help fund this project. So thank you guys, I appreciate it. It's not as clear cut because the water I have here, I'm not totally sure where it came from. It could be bottled, it could be from the tap. Um, we do have different diets and we do have increased mobility that complicate things. There are measures we can take in a forensic setting that do give us a better idea, um, but they're beyond what we presented here today. So these work great for archeological populations, not so great for modern ones. So, but it's a great question, thank you. Yes ma'am. How, is, is there a limit to how far back you could use these isotopes? Do they, do they degrade? Uh, no ma'am, they actually, they don't. As long as you can extract it from the tissue that you have. Uh, I've seen it done all the way back to australopithecines. So very, very early hominins, you know, millions. Personally, I've done back to 4,000 years um, successfully. So yes, but we do have markers of whether or not it's a valid term. Um, based on some chemical signatures. But yeah, really good question. Thank you. Thank you guys. Oh, yes. How long have you been using the isoscape maps? Because I've been out of this for a long time. My oh. master's work was with strontium isotopes. Oh, wonderful. But I've not seen the, the, the oxygen. Um, yeah, the isoscape maps for oxygen. So how long has that been in use? Bowen, uh, Bowen started some in 2003. 
uh, Bowen and Renault. I think those are the first published ones. Um, more recently, they've updated it as late as 2015. So we're seeing them be developed and, and updated currently. Uh, I think 2003 might be the earliest that's been published, at least for oxygen. We do have isoscape maps for other elements as well, as you probably know. <laughs> so, um, but yes, so fairly recently. So, thank you. Thank you. associated with the War of 1812 events. And this project is going to be funded by a mini grant we received this year from the Regional Science Consortium. And because um, the survey requires the bay to be frozen, we're anticipating that data collection will not occur until this coming January or February. So today I'm just going to introduce our research topic and uh, research objectives and talk about the research design. And then finally I'll present what we've been kind of what we've been doing to prepare for the project and our background research and preliminary results from that research. So the War of 1812 um, fought between the United States and the British, and it was apparent early on that control of the Great Lakes was necessary for the American victory. So Erie PA, specifically Presque Isle Bay, and more specifically um, Misery Bay, which is right there was selected to establish the American fleet. And Erie was picked over larger port cities such as Cleveland, Ohio, because um, Presque Isle Bay provided a natural barrier and def defense barrier from the British. So you can see, um, this is an order drawing, this sandbar and this sandbar. Um, and that required a very skilled skilled navigator to navigate <laughs> ships through there. So that, that essentially is what protected the ships during the shipbuilding process. And it was titled Misery Bay. Um, it wasn't titled Misery Bay during the time. It was actually titled Little Bay. And um, it earned the name Misery Bay because of the hardships that the um, men endured there during 1813-1814. Uh, and these maps are really interesting because they show some uh, features that are important to us in interpreti interpreting where um, cultural resources may be. So you can see some, uh, the blockhouse near the bay, and it actually shows the fleet, and this one shows, um, depicts where the fleet would have been. So a little bit more background. Um, there were 11 total ships that uh, made up the American fleet. Six of those ships were built in Presque Isle, and five of those were purchased from Black Rock Naval Base located up near Buffalo. And of the uh, five ships purchased from Black Rock, those uh, only four actually um, were deemed seaworthy. So the Amelia, when it arrived in Presque Isle, they determined it was unseaworthy and they scuttled it, intentionally sunk it in Misery Bay, and it was not used. Um, the five ships from Black Rock were converted commercial vessels. They were converted to warships for the purpose of um, the battle. And the rest of the ships, the, they were used during the battle. The Ohio um, historic records indicate that it was used as a supply ship, so it didn't actually um, see firefight. And after the war, or the battle, um, the US fleet was brought back to Misery Bay along with captured British vessels. 
and there they were repaired. Um, some of them were sold back for com uh, to merchants for commercial purposes, and some of them were sunk so for, pre for preservation purposes. So the Niagara, the Lawrence, the Calding Caledonia, and the Queen Charlotte at one point were all in the bay. And since then, many other vessels have been deposited in the bay, um, even modern fishing tugs and canal boats. So a couple of interesting things. The Niagara um, was actually, the historic documentation indicates that it was sunk twice. So it was sunk directly after um, the war, and then it was sold and raised again in 1836. And the merchant who purchased it was unhappy with um, the specifications, and it was resunk until it was raised in 1913 for historic preservation purposes. So that's interesting moving forward with trying to um, understand the events. So for this project, our research objectives are to locate submerged shipwrecks in Presque Isle's Misery Bay that are associated with the War of 1812. More specifically, we would like to determine if there's evidence of the shipwreck, the Amelia, in the bay. And then finally, we um, believe that we will identify other submerged cultural resources that will contribute to understanding of Lake Erie's maritime culture. Um, because there's little physical evidence of the War of 1812 and the Battle of Lake Erie, anything we find that would be associated with the War of 1812 would be really beneficial for management purposes of these resources. So our research design. There's three main components to our research design. The background research and preliminary mapping to identify the study area. Um, that's mostly what I'll be talking about uh, towards the end of this presentation. And then we have data collection. So the data will be collected across approximately two acres of the frozen bay. And this is kind of what that might look like if uh, the, the bay freezes. So two types of data will be collected, ground penetrating radar data, or GPR, and um, magnetic data. And the GPR data will be collected with a GSSI SIR 3000 instrument with a 400 megahertz antenna. And that instrument is shown up here. And the magnetic survey will be conducted with the Geoscan Research Fluxgate Gradiometer. That is shown right here. The GPR data is going to be collected along transects in 25 centimeter intervals. And I'll go more into that on the next slide. And the magnetic data will be collected along transects in 50 centimeter intervals. After data is collected, post processing will be done. Um, GPR data will be post processed with GSSI Radian soft software, and the magnetic data will be post processed with Geoplot software. After processing, both data sets will be integrated into a project GIS for further analysis. So how does this stuff work? What type of data are we collecting and what can this tell us about the cultural resources? So I'm gonna talk about each system and then um, I'll talk about the data collection method. So magnetic data is collected with a gradiometer and the gradiometer is going to identify anomalies with strong magnetic signatures. And the way it does that is it has two sensors, one at the top and one at the bottom. So the center, sensor at the top is going to be um, reading the above ground earth magnetic field. And the lower sensor is going to be reading the magnetic field for low ground resources. And it's going to be um, calculating the difference between that uh, reading and through that it can identify anomalies with strong magnetic signatures. So for the, in a terrestrial survey, um, it, may, it may pick up features such as fired brick or um, fired pottery, uh, fired clay and fire hearths, but for and then also metal metal objects. For the purposes of this survey, um, metal components of a ship are going to show up as a really strong magnetic anomaly during the magnetic survey. Now the GPR works a little bit different. And the GPR actually sends transmits a signal down below the surface, and that signal reflects off of interfaces or objects below ground. So, in a, once again, in a traditional uh, survey on a ter on, in terrestrial environments, that signal might bounce off of stratigraphic soil changes. It may uh, reflect off of um, buried objects. And for the purposes of our survey, that signal will um, reflect off of the interface between the ice and the water. It will, it will reflect off of the interface between the water and the lake floor. And then it will also reflect off of any submerged resources, any objects below um, ground. And just, I just want to say that GPR is oftentimes thought not to work um, 
when water's present. But in this instance, the GPR is going to treat the ice as a solid, so in the same way it would uh, look, treat rock. And because the water is continuous across the entire survey grid, it will be easy for us to extrapolate where that uh, where the water is. And then finally, data collection method. So the two acre, approximately two acre survey area will be broken up into smaller survey grids, and data is going to be collected along transects. And the way that works is both of these instruments will be either pushed for the GPR and the radiometer will be carried along a transect from the starting point down to the end of the survey grid, one, collecting data the entire way. When the surveyor gets to the end of the survey grid, they'll stop collecting data, go back to the beginning, and then collect data along the next transect. So that, that's a unidirectional manner of collecting data, and basically it ensures high data quality and um, better interpretation of the results in the end. So in preparation for this project, we've been doing a lot of background research looking at historic maps, aerial imagery, um, and other historic documents. We've been bringing those maps into ArcGIS and trying to reconstruct the historic coastlines to identify pre previous locations of Misery Bay, and then from there try to determine where we're going to survey. So here, um, there's the 1937 map and 1908 map. The 1937 map is really interesting. It's kind of difficult to see, but right over here um, there is an X and it actually says the Niagara sunk here. And this is where I want to go back to the introduction when I talked about the Niagara sinking twice. Um, it's kind of unclear which sinking episode this was, so that's something we're going to have to try to figure out. And then two more maps, 1855. Um, this one is interesting because you can see that the neck of Presque Isle has actually been washed away. There's a proposed uh, channel right here that didn't happen, um, but and then here's the um, engineer channel, and then and you can see that Misery Bay and the associated uh, inland lakes look a lot different than the last uh, map, and then finally this map from somewhere between 1815 and 1821. It's difficult to see, but this is the closest one we were able to find so far to the um, War of 1812 events associated with Presque Isle. And this map will be useful because it, um, the blockhouse is mapped, the hospital, and um, from here we can kind of see the, where things were during that time period. So, what we've done so far is trace the coastline in, in uh, ArcGIS and overlay that to see how that coastline has changed. And um, this is the coastline from 1855, 1899, um, and 1937. And then also the green dot shows where the Niagara sinking was plotted on that 1937 map. Um, so it seems like this, the overlay of the coastlines might have actually produced more questions than answers because, um, let me go back real quick. Um, you can see these inland lakes are um, changing rapidly and um, it's a little bit unclear at this time where exactly cultural resources might have been. So adding to that, I want to say that Presque Isle is a spit complex, and so it's a very dynamic environment for changing landscapes. Um, wave action and storm action are constantly moving sand from some areas of the spit and depositing them in other areas of the spit. And we're trying to understand how these processes work and also how the um, engineering of the canal right here has prevented some of this movement movement to determine where the best place to um, put our survey grid is, should be. So to wrap up, um, preliminary mapping and background research discussed today um, did aid in the understanding of spit, uh, spit transition and specific areas of interest in Misery Bay. However, we're only surveying two acres of the 100 plus bay, acre bay. So we really need to narrow down the most likely location that the Amelia would have been in the bay and then establish a survey grid. And I want to add that today, um, this morning, I was fortunate enough to meet with some people, some folks from the DCNR, the Maritime Museum, and the PAC grant, and they gave me some really great resources that um, I wasn't able to access online. And I'm hoping that review of those resources will help narrow down where, the, where cultural resources might be located in the best possible area to establish this grid. So further work, we are going to uh, conduct more analysis of the tra spit transition since 1813, um, review the historic records, specifically the ones acquired today, to determine the most likely location of the Amelia, 
And then finally, we're going to get out there, um, weather permitting, in January and February and try to get, conduct the survey. such as ice allows us more spatial control. So some surveys are conducted drag, uh, with the devices in a boat, but that's harder to uh, maintain spatial control because of you know wind and just the other factors that um, are at play. Also, the GPR machine actually has a distance encoder wheel, so it's really important to have that wheel on the ice and turning so we can keep have that spatial control. Okay, I have a question as far as when you process this data, um, how is the end result displayed? Is it, uh, it's obviously not numerical, so how is that depicted at the end? Um, so, I'll try to think of the best way. So, they, it'll be brought into GI, into a mapping program GIS and um, we'll produce maps. And the maps, um, you can kind of play with the colors to highlight anomalies and they'll actually show up. So, say, um, just for an example that's familiar to myself, say you're looking at um, a foundation of a house, that'll actually show up as a square anomaly. Um, and in this case, with a shipwreck or anomalies below the surface, you'll be able to visually see the footprint of those features. And then because you're doing two acres out of 100, and uh, Mystery Bay itself under the waters, which represents an anomaly historically, what would be uh, what restrictions are there? Is it time or funding that would uh, enable you to go uh, with a, a, a larger search area within Misery Bay? Um, I'm inclined to say a little bit of both. Okay. Um, time. The so if we were to expand our transects, say we did 50 centimeter transects for the GPR instead of 25 centimeter transects. We could, at, we could increase our survey area and still do it within the same amount of time. And that might be, that may be doable because your transect spacing is dependent on how large of a resource you're trying to locate. So with a shipwreck, that's pretty big. So 25 centimeter spacing might be a little too tight. We could probably expand to 50 and then expand our survey grid. Um, but that's something we'd have to look at further. Thank you, excellent. Any other questions? Yes. So do you think those historical maps are actually helping or, or confounding <laughs> your product? Um, it's hard to say. I think only having four was causing a little bit more confusion. But after today, um, the resources I was able to gather today, we, we have double that. And that's going to help really narrow it down. But I would say at the time, of creating this presentation, it was causing more confusion. How will, sorry. How will you know if, it, if the Amelia is someone gonna dive and like check that out, or just by the, the size and the shape of it? Um, size and shape will help a little, but with geophysical surveys, we can never say 100% this is this. So this survey will guide subsequent diver surveys or other types of investigations to actually ground truth it to determine if it really is. But there were historic documents um, that were found that estimated the size of the ships so in the US fleet. So um, depending on the size of the anomaly, we might be able to make interpretations suggesting this is possibly, this could possibly be the case. I work at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History.
house, but um, I will say that the, the events of the Battle of Lake Erie drew a lot of political um, interest in Erie, and that resulted in the canal, the establishment of that um, engineered canal shortly after the battle. So in this instance, we're really lucky because that prevented extre more extreme landscape change that could have happened. So there's still landscape change that we have to deal with, but the, um, it, without that engineered canal, it would have been even more extreme. Anything else?